Welcome back to Loving Yourself Fit Podcast. Today, I have Gisela. Welcome, Gisela. Hey, everybody. Thank you, Megan, for having me here. I'm so excited to be here with you. I know we've been trying to get this in the works for a while, so I'm glad we're making it happen. Yes, you are someone, as soon as I started my podcast, which wasn't too (laughs) far off, I thought of you immediately. I wanted to interview you right away. We've had some scheduling things, but I finally got you here and we're going to talk all about all this stuff. I'm going to let people know what you do, basically, just in a nutshell. Gisela, she's a writer, a life strategist and business coach, and she helps women build a life and a business from their wholeness. So that sounds beautiful to me. I love that. Why don't you tell me first kind of, What got you here? Like, where did you start? And what was your transformation? And what what made you, well, I'll get to other questions. Why don't you start with where you started? Well, um, you know, mine was very much a, like the typical uh, hero story journey, as they call it in marketing, which is like, you start in a really dark place. And I would like to have not started in such a dark place. But ultimately, I started when I realized that I really hated being a mom. Like, I really did not like the role it encompassed and it was given to me. Like I loved my little baby. I was like, you're so cute. I love you. I can breastfeed you all day. But the rest was bullshit. (laughs) The rest was like, I don't like that. Nobody tells me about how like isolating it is and how truly like the depression hits so, so deeply how your partnership really unravels uh, because you've accepted roles that weren't, talked about beforehand and these kind of disillusionment with motherhood that was like oh my god what is going on right um and that was really heartbreaking for me because I felt like you know instead of savoring the moments of when my daughter was young I was like I can't wait to get out of this like this needs to be over fast this cannot be over fast enough and I realized at first I used to blame myself for that I'm like why do I feel like this I'm such a bad mom Mm -hmm. for thinking this what is wrong with me But I, through my healing and becoming who I am today, I realized that I had no support system. I had no understanding of what it was to raise a child in 2016 back then, right? And I had no other moms around me to teach me. So, of course, I was not going to understand anything. Now, looking back, I'm like, no wonder. Like, I think I would do it differently now. But that was the igniter. That was the the, the fire that sparked something in me because I'm like, Oh my God, like I love my daughter, but this is, this is not okay for me. And so when they told me I had to put her back in daycare, I said, okay, well, this is ridiculous. I am not putting my child in daycare, like to make enough to pay for daycare. I'm like, so that I'm not with my child all day. I'm like, make it make sense to me, please. Like you're telling me I have to go work to make the thousand two hundred dollars for my daughter's daycare which leaves me like a hundred dollars to my name because that's just it, it's logically it doesn't make sense so yeah. that was the thing i saw the system and i was like this is bullshit they like this cannot be the thing the end of me like i was 26 when i had my daughter and i'm like something has to change so i started well it was a dark place because i started to get super depressed And in that depression, I wanted to leave my daughter with her dad. I decided, I I remember looking at the door and being like, I'm not cut out to be a mom. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad looking at that version of me now because it wasn't that I wasn't cut out to be a mom. I'm an amazing mom. Like, honestly, I am an amazing mom. I didn't have the support system. I didn't have the understanding. And it was so sad to see me in that place. But it was that that initiated this, I need to evolve and grow above this system. You, I cannot be working in a place where they tell me how much I make. I cannot be wasting my gifts. I went to school for political science and I felt like I wasn't going to do anything with it. I'm like, what? I love studying it, but I don't see myself in politics. Like, that's hilarious. Like, that's not even my personality. (laughs) So that was the, that was the initial point of me actually wanting to leave my family. Like I was ready to walk out on my family. And I called my friend one night in the car and I was like, I was like, Danny, I think I'm leaving. Like, I, I'm done. Like, I think I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave my daughter. He, she has an amazing dad. I think that this is it. And she, I was crying. And she's like, no, 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 Gisela, just hold on. Let, let me talk to my sister. She's a, and her sister's a coach. And she's like, because 
we're all like 26 years old. Like we, they're not moms. I'm not, I'm a new mom. They had no idea what to say to me, but they're just like, hold on. This is not normal. Like, <laughs> like don't make decisions right now. So I remember I jumped on a call with her sister, who, by the way, is younger than me, but has been a coach since he was 19. And she just sits with me and, uh, the next day and she's like, Gisela, don't worry. There's an alternative way. She, I, I, and, and I remember just she was like a light in my tunnel of darkness where I was like, I had no idea what entrepreneurship was. I had no idea what starting your own business was. I thought you had to go to the bank, ask for a loan and open a brick and mortar business. That's what I thought entrepreneurship was. And yeah. it's like, and I had shit credit. I'm like, there's no way the bank is going to give me money. I'm like, there's no way. So I'm not an entrepreneur. And she's like, no, Gisela, there's this online digital space of places where you can learn to be a marketer and you can learn to do websites and you can learn to do this. And I'm like, what? This is interesting. This is interesting. Tell me more. And girl, I had zero dollars in my bank account. I remember being like, my maternity leave was almost done. I had to go back to work almost, but I just said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to learn this. I'm going to stay home and learn this. Like, I'm going to figure out how to work for myself. I don't care. Like that was my, that was basically in a, in a, just the beginning of all this, of all this transformation, of all this embodiment, of all this realizing that I was trying to build a business, but what I was really trying to build was myself up again, right. you know? The business was just a tool to get to the to self-development, you know? So yeah. it was in that realization that I've learned about, uh, and that's why self-love is one of my biggest mission statements for my whole business, is because it's not about the strategy anymore. I used to rela- think was the strategy that was going to make me successful. I used to think, if I figure out this online thing, I'm going to be successful, right? But the truth is, it was when I figured myself out, Sorry. when I understood how I worked, mm-hmm. when I learned to love myself, and be like, what does Gisela want? What is her truth? Yeah. When I started to work from that, that's when everything just like exploded 10 times what I thought in terms of abundance, opportunity, mindset. Like I just broke, I live in my own reality at this point. Like it's kind of crazy, but it's true. <laughs> well, and I've watched you, I've watched you just as a butterfly transform here. I've known, I think I've known you since you were like how old. Huh. Really Probably like 11 or 12. Yeah. <laughs> so, I she was about 11. We used to uh-huh. dance together and stuff. Yes. Um, and I've watched this whole amazing transformation. And that's why I was like, I want to hear all about it. <laughs> and now I see you living your truth, living your dream, living this beautiful life. You moved away. Do you want to yes. talk a little bit about that? Like, I want to hear all about Yes, that. totally. Place now. So guys, this is so connected to what I, what we, what I say, like really living in your own reality. Okay. I have always wanted to live, to live somewhere where the mountains were. I didn't know if that was Colombia, but I wanted to live in a beautiful place with mountains. And that's always been an image in my head. I've always been able to visually see mountains and feel so connected to them. And I'm like, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> it's the truth. Like we all listen. The thing about healing is so powerful. Is because when you heal, you get more clear about what you want. Yeah. You get super clear on what you want. No more fluff. No more. I'm doing this to get this. I'm doing this. No more. Like you just know because you are connected to your intuition. And moving away was something that needed to happen. I just didn't know how. The how I never knew. Yeah. I remember it was twenty. It was uh. June, July, uh, July, 2020, the borders were closed. I was, I was in the, I was in the really, really cocoon stage of my healing where I was just like internally healing, working through a lot of shadow work and crying almost every day. And I was just kind of seeing the positive again, right? Because part of this healing is you got to go inward and it's not, it's not cute, but trust me, it's so necessary. (laughs) And I remember seeing that image of the mountains and I'm like, you know what, if COVID's going to kill me, I hope it kills me somewhere hot. Like, I just want to be in the mountains. Like, if we're all going to die, if this is the end of the world, like, I'd rather be where I want to be. Right. And let me tell you, everything was set against me. There was no reason for me to be able to have moved to Colombia when I did. The borders were closed. I was still in a custody battle with my ex over my daughter's custody because he wanted full custody. Oh, man. I, that wasn't even resolved. Okay. I 
was just coming out of depression. So my business was just starting to pick up. Yeah. Okay. I wasn't fully like making money or, or making bank every month, you know? Yeah. And like, so I literally made a decision where I remember just saying, you know what? I, I trust myself. Mm-hmm. I trust myself. And, and this want that I have to move was so much bigger than me. Mm-hmm. And, and I just, I remember going online, seeing a ticket for $500 for a border that was still closed, by the way, it's like, sorry, you can, you can buy the ticket, but we don't know if it's going to be open. So b- good luck, but don't worry. Like we'll, we'll help you figure it out. Like I remember the airline was like, just buy from us, but it's super cheap. Buy from us. We'll give it to you dirt cheap. It was dirt cheap. It was $500 there and back. I was like, you know what? If I lose $500, whatever. I didn't even tell my, the father of my daughter. I didn't, I, I'm like, I don't know how I'm going to make this happen, but September, I was like, September 14th, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I think I was just, I was like, you know what? There's, there's a lot of faith in myself, but there's a lot of faith in also God in the universe. Like I know that the way I've I've been able to, to heal is through doing the work, but believing that there's that like the God is always on my side, that she's always going to work in the best of my interest and my family. And I knew deep down my ex was going to agree because I'm like, you know what? You could stay in Canada in the cold. I was like, I'm gonna, I have the best argument. Listen, and I, so I came to Colombia. The borders open. I magically made it here, not on the date that I was supposed to make it because the borders were still closed, but I made it October 3rd. Right. And I just remember, like, I started to show him pictures. And let me tell you, in August, right before, because I was supposed to live in September back then, right before I was supposed to leave, I get a notice from the court. The court resolved it. He can't fight you for your daughter anymore. It's 50-50. He can't do shit about it. And I'm like, oh. I'm like, I knew it was going to happen. Because listen, I'm like, <laughs> I just, my energy at that point was like, I'm attached to nothing and I'm fully supported. Yeah. That was my energy. My energy was like, I know that I can't control other people. And if people want to hurt me, They can try, but I'm protected. And that's what it felt like during that time. It felt like literally everything thrown my way was like this. I was like, "Eh!" like matrix, (laughs) like, (laughs) (laughs) it literally felt like that. It felt like it was, I was like, oh my God, like, I'm not even fighting back, but this is cool. Like I was just, cause I'm stuck. Okay. I'm Latina. So I'm all about fighting. I'm all like, what do you mean? You don't say this to me and look, right. That was like old me. I was like that fire spicy. But I found a deeper way of fighting that's not even fighting. It's literally taking that energy of anger, because, oh, God, I, I can ha- I have a lot of anger. Taking that energy of anger and, and channeling it through myself and using it to create clear boundaries energetically. And I just mm-hmm. decided I'm going to show up like the truest version of myself, like the mm-hmm. most, like, like no one's action can take me out of my, out of my zone. So every right. time people would try to hit, I'd be like, and that pisses <laughs> people more off. Like that actually pisses them more off. It's like, oh, she's not, they think they know you, B. They think they know you. They're like, oh, I know this girl. She's going to, she's going to, she's going to act up. She's going to show the, the judge what a crazy Latina she is. I was like, Mm-mm. my higher self, my higher self is, That's you awesome. know, <laughs> So I, everything started working out in my favor. Like literally I just made a decision and I just said like, universe, show me how, if this is in the best interest of my life, show me how. And that's how it went. That's awesome. I love that. And just circling back to mom guilt and being alone as a new mom and all that, I think it's a huge topic. And I think probably everyone can relate in some way to a lot of the stuff you said at the start there. Um, me and Gisela were pregnant at exactly the same time with my second yes. child first, right? Yes, so um, totally. we were belly dancing together with big pregnant bellies. <laughs> it was so fun. It was so fun. I love that. We had babies at the same time, but we weren't really together. We were in our own. Yes, world. in our own bubble. Yes. Um, so close, yet so far apart. I don't know how that happened, but. Um, totally. But what do you think, what advice do you have for moms, like busy moms, you know, they feel that way. They feel like I can't, I can't do me. I can't, because I think that's a lot of the thing. You don't even think about doing you when you're Mm -hmm. in that circumstance. You're just like, and how are you going to then be a good mom 
if you're first of all not setting examples to your child of what a healthy awesome individual is and also totally. just if you're not happy how are you raising someone else you know to be this awesome person so do you have any little tips oh god um, i have a lot of i have a lot of tips because this is something i've dealt with for the past four years of my life as i've yeah. traveled trust me i remember being on a plane to go to a retreat and someone very close to me said, how dare you leave your sick child? Mm -hmm. How dare you leave your sick child? You're such, you preach mom freedom and you are the worst mom ever. And it was hilarious to me, but it really hurt me. Cause I'm like, I I'm, know, here, it's I'm here trying to better myself. I'm, I'm like, would you tell that to a man who was traveling to learn something? Do you think I'm the only one that made this baby? Like, does she not have a child, a father? I mean, like, it just, it blew my mind. So I understand because the mom guilt for me was not like these whispers behind my back. No, no, no. It was like family, friends, close yeah. ones, being extremely judgmental of my choice because I have this rebellious spirit. The more people tell me what to do, I go the opposite. And I did that with motherhood. I under, most women would have like, like completely dived headfirst into motherhood and been like, I don't exist. Mm -hmm. And that's how they survive, right? I couldn't do that. I couldn't completely dive in. So I, 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 I saw this like resistance. I had to fight back for myself. I'm like, I need, I can't lose myself. I have to keep myself, you know? And so that constant reminder made it like my mission to like overcome this guilt. Okay. And guys, this system set up against us. We, this whole system of patriarchy, of how motherhood work, of how they pay us less, it's literally based on making us feel guilt and shame. If they don't make us feel guilt and shame, then how do they make money off us? How do they sell us the best $400 breastfeeding pump? How do they sell us the best crib that they're gonna use but for one night because they spend the rest of the nights in your bed? You know, like, how are they gonna sell us if we're not guilted into it, if we're not ashamed of being a mother? If we're like, I'm not doing enough, I'm not working hard enough, I'm not, giving them natural enough she didn't you know so the, the system i want you guys to understand if you're a new mom listening is set up against you okay you are not crazy and it is not a crazy thing that you're feeling the system really wants to shame you so that you become the best at consuming why do you think they sell so much alcohol to moms oh we're gonna make little moms alcoholics after 5 a.m 5 p.m because you need to relax mommy wine right yeah. it's hilarious it's a whole system and girl I, if i came here to do anything in this world is match the patriarchy okay that's just my role <laughs> it's like you want to sell me something i'm gonna sell it back at you you think you're gonna sell me on something? <laughs> so guys so the guilt is so so not imagined but here's the thing guilt the more you carry out in silence, and this is where it gets toxic, right? Because us moms, and I remember being in mommy groups, no one would talk about it. Oh, I love my kids. Did you feed them organic? And, I, and in my head, I was like, I don't like my partner. Like, who? <laughs> like, like, I do not like him. Like, I think I made a big mistake here. Like, someone, did anybody feel like when they, and I was like, what is this thing that you like, you know, like, I, I just, there were so many things I wanted to talk about, but moms were just like, mm-mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I love my husband. Just a, it's a passing moment. Don't worry. And I was, I, so they gaslit me, right? Because they were unable to accept their own guilt and shame. So shame can only survive in the context of secrecy, of darkness, of I carry it alone. Mm -hmm. Right? So, so I just started saying the thing, right? And that was so hard for me. I was just started saying the thing. I'm like, I hate this and I hate that. That's how my millennials started because I'm like, I can't be the only one here that doesn't, right. that, that's like, I feel gaslit by the whole motherhood industry. Like, what is this? And, yeah. and so what I would say is you have to understand that the systems are against you, number one. Number two, this mom guilt, mom shame, it's something, it's, it's just the consequence of what you've been living through. So it's normal. So for example, if as women, we've been indoctrinated to be uh, docile, to, to be pleasant, to be, to be pal palatable, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we go into these, by the time we go into motherhood, we're so used to being palatable in a lot of ways. And so we get involved in this, oh no, but you should love it. You should love it. And you're like, of course I should. Of course I should. Yes, definitely. Right? And the moms that don't admit it, 
they're usually always out in little mommy soirees drinking wine and pretending everything's okay. Right? And it's painful because I'm like, I can't pretend. I, if I start drinking with you guys, I'll out drink you and then I'll be plastered on the floor. Okay? Yeah. It's just, I have no, like my barometer for holding to holding it for like holding my shit together is not very good. So what I would say is, be honest with yourself. Say the things. Don't let it live in secrecy inside of you. Whatever you feel, find a trusted friend. Don't go, don't go say that to your like 50-year-old mother because she might really judge you and that could be a really that could really backfire on you if you can't trust her. But I had friends that weren't moms. So that helped me because they didn't, they kind of saw how hard it was. And they're like, oh shit, that shit's hard. Like, and I'm like, yeah, it is. So I had these trusted friends that I could go to and and kind of vent in a healthy way, not vent to stay, but vent enough to change and be like, okay, if I don't like this, what do I do about it? Because a lot of us like to complain, but we don't do shit. And that's just not how I roll. Yeah. You know, it's part of understanding that you're allowed to complain and not like something, but you say, staying silent and then just repeating the patterns and repeating the day to day. Okay, I get by like this. Yeah. Then you're not really doing anything. All you're doing is creating a little, a little mom shame monster inside you that's going to come out and, and break shit. Because that's what happened to me too. Even though I was being honest, I was like, no, this is not okay. Right? My partner started to impose like, what's wrong with you? Like that, like with looks, right? With looks of like, are you okay? Like, I don't even know if this is normal. Like, do you like not want to be here? And I'm like, I don't think so. Like, you know, like, (laughs) so the world is going to be a really cruel place to moms because of the way we've been, we've been um, idealized, the caregiver, the lover, the home, the home for, for the family, right? We physically become a home. So therefore, our sexuality is supposed to die. Our needs are, aren't supposed to be met. Um, we must sacrifice, right? And I was like, Mm-mm. so understanding that that system is not, is not supposed to, if you don't like it, you don't have to work within it. You do not have to work within it. And you can really just surround yourself with women that are safe enough for you to be able to, to vent, to say, I don't like how this is. I'm scared about this. I'm feeling this, this, and this. And honestly, if you could afford therapy, and I say that afford because it is not affordable to have therapy a, a, a lot of times, you know, get support, you know, in order for you to, to be able to have a safe space for yourself. But this mom guilt thing is, is a marketing tool. It's a marketing tool that has been inserted inside of you for you to self-police. So as moms, we're in the comfort of our own home by ourselves, and we're literally self-policing mm-hmm. instead of being, our, of being comfortable, of being of experiencing motherhood in our way. No, put your child to bed in her crib by herself at this time. And if you don't do it, you're a bad mom. Your child needs to be this, this, and this. I'm like, who invented these rules? Right. If those rules are making you miserable, yeah. It's really troubling that that other moms are usually the ones shaming us into all this. Like it's often women. And I I mean, Mm -hmm. okay, men, you're in there. But like a lot of the time, it's other women. Like, oh, my God, you put your your kid to bed at that time? What? Or, oh, why would you do that? And I'm like, well, because that's what works for me, right? Like, I have questions like that all the time. Like, what? And it's all the time. Yeah. Every woman. And it's like, oh, my gosh. So I love that, like, if more and more women like us can come out and say, you know, we can be different in our mothering. We can do different things. They're different children. They don't need the same things. Let's stop shaming each other. And I loved what you said about support in general, even not as a mom, even just as a a woman or a person. Mm -hmm. Um, Just if you're going through things, because we're all going through things, whether we're a mom or a career woman or both or whatever, trying to lose weight, trying to get fit, whatever the case may be, I feel like the support and being able to just say something without being censored you know, to friends or a therapist or a family, whoever it is, is super important. I think that's a huge, like, takeaway right there. Um, totally, totally. Yeah. And and speaking of, I'm just bringing fitness in there. Um, <laughs> speaking of movement, I met you through movement, through dance and everything. And I see, I follow you on Instagram. I see you <laughs> dancing. I see you doing yoga. I see you doing all your beautiful movements. 
Um, what role do you think that plays in all of this, in all this transformation and feeling yourself and finding your true self? Um, what has movement or exercise or yoga or whatever your form is done for you? That's such a great question. I think it was such a big part of my transformation. Um, I always say that dance saved my life in a lot of ways because growing up, I had mm. a lot of instability, but dancing as a young kid, had, I had that one thing that I did once a week that was consistent. Mm. And so since I was little, I was trained that movement was important in me. I needed, it was my one hour, two hours, didn't matter how long it was on a weekend where I would be in my, in my zone, right? Yeah. Getting goosebumps again. I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> Same here. I'm with you on that. Right. So it's like, so I I took that with me, and my body changed many times through different mm -hmm. fluctuations because depression hit me, especially after motherhood. So I actually gained a lot of the weight postpartum, not through the pregnancy. I gained some through the pregnancy, and then lost it, and then got back like gained about fifty pounds after after having my daughter six six months after. Yeah. And that was really a hard hit for me because I was someone that my body didn't used to hurt. My, I, I got um, pre, uh, prenatal arthritis. I got mm. I, sciatica while I was pregnant. I got a bunch of like ailments out of nowhere and I couldn't move a lot. I could only go for walks. I needed belly support because my back was in so much pain. I had to stop working really early on. And so I went from someone that felt really healthy and in my body to someone that I couldn't use movements in a healthy way anymore to get me into an emotionally better state. So that was really hard for me. That was really one of the most painful moments for me. But it gave me one of my biggest lessons because back then when I used to dance, I used to dance to look pretty. I used to dance to feel sexy. I used to dance and I would look in the mirror and compare myself to others. But the moment that I had to transition postpartum into loving movement again, I stopped doing it for that reason. First of all, when I had a 48 hour labor and popped out a child through my vagina, I was like, I'm a queen. I'm a queen. Where is my crown? I came up, I had a, I had a relative say the day after I popped my child that I still look six months pregnant and I wanted to be offended. I really did, but I felt like a queen. And I'm like, I'm gonna save that. I'm gonna save that for later though. I'm gonna save that for later. But right now I feel like a queen. So you can't get me out of my throne, okay? So <laughs> there was just this magical moment of birthing my child with so much power that I'm like, my body's more than just a tool to look pretty. Right, yeah. My body is not just for other people's entertainment and for other people to stare and be like, oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, she's right. so, she moves so well. And it was that realization that I'm like, okay, either I can go into this and hate my body because I got to a point when I was 210 pounds from being 150 pounds. Yeah. And I was like, my body was in pain, right? My body was in so much pain carrying that weight that I had to make a conscious choice of like, I need to make a change, but it can't be the changes that I used to make where like I would cut down my eating mm -hmm. so drastically where I would, where I would go into famine mode where I'd be like, okay, I'm not eating all day. And then I would eat the next day, right? That wasn't working for me because I was breastfeeding and I had to find healthier ways. I'm like, okay, I have to find healthier ways. And I remember I had this thing where I went with one of, with two of my best friends, but I went to the nude beach. I used to love going to the nude beach before, but I'm like, I'm hot. Like, of course. <laughs> but now I was like, my boobs are hanging. Like, I don't know. I don't know. Like, I used to be able to see my coochie. Now I don't know. Like, <laughs> and so my friends just like, listen, Gisela, we just got to embrace ourselves. We just got to love ourselves. And I'm like, fine, I'm going to do it because we're doing this out of sisterhood. And I remember just going to the nude beach with her and my other friend, we just got naked and it was so fun. And I still <laughs> had that power of like, I gave birth. And so that gave me the confidence when I couldn't like, when I couldn't physically feel like I was, I was worthy of, of doing things for myself. And so I started my process slowly. Here's what I did. I remember feeling in so much pain and I'm like, my body's not the same body I used to know. So one, I had to get, start to get to know it again. Before, I used to be able to eat small portions throughout the day, and that would make a big difference, right? That would make a big difference in my body. Now that wasn't working anymore, and my body was more hungry. So I'm like, okay, maybe I'm just going to try to eat fuller meals where I feel good, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to move my body a little more, 
instead of just retaining that energy in. And I remember when I first started getting getting into my body again, it was so hard to walk with the stroller. I would go up a hill and I'd be like, yeah. and that really, that really fucking scared me, Megan. I was like, I've never had this problem in my life. I, I feel like I've been through this all also. <laughs> Being super unfit all of a sudden. We've been fit all our life. And I'm like, what is this? Yeah. And I remember being out of breath and I, and then I, so I was smoking out of my depression at that time too, to add to the, to the, to the wound of this. Okay. I was smoking like a, like an old man who's 80, who's been smoking all his life, which I've never smoked before. I just picked it up. I picked up smoking because I was so sad about my life. I'm like, this is the only thing that I can do. That's okay. In my life. <laughs> it's not illegal. I'm not hurting anybody, but I'm hurting myself. Yourself, yeah. And so it's so funny, but I, I remember being out of breath and I went to the doctor because it was happening more constant. And he sent me to the ER because he's like, there might be a pulmonary embolism. And that freaked me out. I'm like, what the fuck is that? Like, I freaked out. And I made that decision that day. I'm like, I can't be a sick person because I've been healthy my whole life. Like I and it took it, but it took accepting myself in that moment. It took being like, OK, Gisela, we're 210 pounds. You you can't breathe. Um, you walk up a hill and you feel like you're dying. So let's start with what we can do. So I literally just bought, I just bought, I went to Lululemon's. I bought Q pants because I was like, I'll buy, I'll buy clothes when I'm, when I'm thinner. That's what he said. I'm like, what? I'm, I'll buy clothes when I'm thinner. So I, the first thing I did is like, I, I throw all my old clothes. I remember I throw, I'm like, I'm never going to be thin again. I don't care. I'm, I'm stopping. Like, I'm not going to torture myself every time I open the closet to see the size six jean that I am not going to fit in anymore. My hips just don't go that way anymore. Okay. So I, I got rid of all that. I did a sale with my daughter's clothes that didn't fit her in mine uh, at home. And I got rid of everything. So I went and bought stuff my size. I was now a size 12, yeah. 12, 14. I'm like, 12, 14, let's go. I bought some cute gym stuff. I'm like, I'm going to make this easy for myself. I bought like gloves so that if I do a push up, I don't hurt my hands. I bought earphones. I bought cute things. And all I did was do one block around my house for like three months walking, yes. like yes. light jogging. I remember, I remember when I first started, <laughs> I was like 200 pounds too. I was like, oh boy, I was out of breath. I was like, my big walk was like walking to Shoppers Drug Mart. I was like, there's my goal. I'm going to walk there. It's going to be amazing. I'm going to feel so tired and hurt. And then I'm going to hopefully walk back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my first walk with the stroller, I was like, oh man, I'm tired. I'm a block out and I'm tired. <laughs> it's hard. It's like hard. But you have to accept yourself where you are. And I just said, I'm going to push. And after I just started my, pushing my body one block more, one block more, <laughs> one block more, all of a sudden, me and my daughter are doing 5K in her running stroller. And I'm like, beast mode but but the strength it took to get there it's like I don't want to I don't want to run over that like I want you guys to understand like it took sweat blood and tears to get to that my lungs were not having it for a while I had to quit smoking many times and I would fall back because of my depression and I would and and so there were these variables around it but I constantly came back to it's okay this is all okay. I do not judge you for being a smoker out of nowhere. I don't judge you for being, um, be, having gained all that weight. Like I just didn't judge myself anymore. And instead I would love my body. And I would look in the mirror and I remember giving myself, and I still do it to this day. I give myself oil massages and I'm like, you're beautiful. You, you have so much strength. Like, look at what you've done. Look what we continue to accomplish. One of my latest endeavors was a 16 K hike up a mountain to a paramour paramour where it's like the top, top of a mountain with a lake, okay? With the purest water. It was magical. And it was exhausting. It was the biggest challenge of my life, honestly. I've never done, like, I, I almost, like, did not make it. I cried a couple times. I'm like, is this for real? Like, are we there yet? And he's like, <sighs> but that's where I got in. And this was what? Two years ago, three? Where I started to really develop my, and challenging my body. But it took a lot of love. It took a lot of accepting where I am, not fighting where I am. You know, I often share my social media that I used to go to pole classes when I was really heavy. And, I, and all the women there were like super sexy, wearing like little tiny. And I love that for them. I'm like, that's so hot. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sexy now. 
Yes. And I just yes. always think back that I am sexy no matter what size I am. Yeah. I'm always, I'm always delicious. I always like to say yeah. that about myself. I'm like, I'm delicious. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> you know. It's so, important. so embracing so, where you are and doing things that are fun, doing things that are yeah. fun for you that are out of your comfort zone. So much of the time I meet women that are in their head and they're trying to think themselves out of a problem. It's like, you can't think yourself out of problems. You got to do things and action will get you out of a problem. Yeah. Right? So movement is my way of creating action for my body. When I am too much in my head, I go to movement. I go take a class. I do this. I do that because it gets you out of your head because you know what? The system that we're in wants us to be in our head. It wants us to question everything we do constantly and to shame ourselves for wanting something differently. But yeah. in those moments where you are in your body, you're fully in your body. It's like, it's okay. literally for me, it's like an ecstasy high. I'm like, I've never done ecstasy, but literally I'm like, if, if I've done ecstasy, I feel like this is what it would be like. Yeah. Like, I'm just like <laughs> in a moment, like, you know, like, that's what I think it would feel like. Thing tip right there is, is, um, like if you're in your head too much and you're thinking and you're overthinking and you're this and you're that, just start moving in some way, do some movement, do some action, do some, go for a walk, go for, do some dance, do a workout. And I feel like that often gets you over that, that hurdle in your brain. You know what I mean? And, and I love the, I mean, loving yourself at all stages is, is my big thing. And I totally believe in it. Like, I mean, I feel like we can't work towards ourselves if, if we're hating ourselves. Like, you're not going to want to work on yourself if you hate yourself. I mean, totally. it's not something you want to do. And, um, yeah, so you said you, you smoked and then you quit and then you smoked. So let's talk a little bit about starting over. So starting over on, on many different things. I mean, you had the smoking, um, we had babies, so we were kind of starting over right there. We've all just been becoming entrepreneur out of nowhere, yeah. thinking it was a brick oh, and mortar business. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how do people start over again when they have some sort of kind of like thing happen where they kind of get off track. I've done it a million times where I'm like, whoa, I have a whole new life here now. Yeah. I got to start back up. And, and how do you think, you know, people can do that with ease? Life has a way of resetting us when we're off track in a lot of ways. And yeah. I, take, I take them, I take them like God's little nudges and, and he just like, eh, 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 like, you know, he's I like, we that. go I somewhere. And like, so when I, when I reset, when I start over, I take it as like, first of all, I'm grateful because even if it's bad, even if my house is burning down, literally like so many times it's felt like I, I, I used to run away. I used to be what I called an emotional runner. I used to travel all the time be like, I broke up with my boyfriend going to Mexico. I, yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I failed university, my university course. I'm going to Cuba. Like, you know, like run away. I'm I getting I, I was a runaway or two and I would just, it wouldn't be beautiful places. It would be like, we had a fight. I'm going for a run outside. <laughs> like I would leave. I'd be like, I wouldn't get to go to Cuba or Mexico, but slam <laughs> <laughs> a door and leave. And, like, I would get to deal yeah. with things. You know what? Your, your, yours was healthier because mine was expensive, a lot of debt inducing. <laughs> and also mine had na mine had names too, because some of them were men. And I was like, Oh God, that I could have avoided that. Like if I wasn't running, you know what I mean? But <laughs> a lot of us when shit starts to because a new for in order for a new beginning to happen something has to fall apart right mm -hmm. in order for this reset to happen something has to fall apart but we think that a new beginning is always this exciting thing right but no at the end of the day even if it feels exciting something is dying away in order for this rebirth let's look at it like that okay so when you're starting over when you're starting over many of the times that you're really starting over I felt that I'm literally running away from my house being on fire. And what I, and that's because I'm afraid to, we're, we're afraid, afraid to face the pain. We're afraid to face the hurt, yeah. right? But what if I discovered this by accident because I was broke, so I couldn't travel. <laughs> I couldn't leave the country because I was fighting for my daughter's custody. And I was pretty much like in my rock bottom of all where it's like, you really can't move. Yeah. especially with COVID and stuff that was going to happen. Um, and I remember being in my house and feeling like it was burning down and I couldn't go anywhere. And so I, I, I sat in that moment in that pain and I felt like my house was burning away. And instead of running, I sat there. I watched it. I watched 
everything crumble. I watch people, if, I, if you ever read my book and I show you the document that said what a bad mom I was, it called me all the things under the rainbow. I was a drug addict apparently. I was a lot of things. CAS was called on me. So I was in the brink of my, not only was I in pain emotionally and physically, but yeah. here I was literally being told all the things that I was bad at, like yeah. constantly. And instead of running, I just sat there and I accepted them. So if those beginnings were you, were, were they're not so fun and so nice, instead of running away with anything, any coping mechanism you have, it doesn't have to be traveling. It could be going out and partying. It could be drinking a lot. It could be going for a cigarette. In those moments, I want you to sit more in the pain of it. And I know you're like, Gisela, but that sounds horrible. Yes, for an extra 10 seconds. Right. But once you get over that 10 second hump of like, this feels like shit, there's this wisdom that comes through where it's like, oh shit, it's not as horrible as I think I, it is. It's not the end of the world. This doesn't destroy me. This doesn't get to destroy me. Right. So, no, so when you're starting over, we always see it as like, oh, maybe we're starting over and it's fun. But if it's not, I want you to sit in that and to accept it, to accept, okay, I have no control over this. Right. right? I have no control over what's about to happen. I don't know if this is going to be good or bad, but I have no choice. Sometimes we make changes by choices, but it's not so often. Often is we are kicked into choices because we've been, we've held. How I see it is like when you withhold making a decision, when you withhold saying yes to what you know is better for you, then the universe kind of like, um, excuse me, get your butt out of here. <laughs> like, let's go, let's go, let's pick up, let's pick up the pieces and let's roll. Okay. You know? Yeah. And so when we are forced into movement, it feels painful. And so the best thing to do is to just accept where you are, accept where you are and let the cards fall off. So many of us think that when, things fall apart that we're falling apart. What's falling apart is the things that are not working in your favor. It's your ego that's not working in your favor. It's the people that are not supposed to, are not meant to be in your life anymore. It's the things that need to wash, be washed away, right? Mm -hmm. To leave the fertile ground for something to be, to be grown new. So it's like, yeah. don't fight the destruction, accept it. That's my number one thing when you're starting yeah. over. Secondly, yeah. Become like a kid. I love, I love the moment I realized I learned about inner child healing. I remember one of my first sessions with a coach I had about inner child. And I never thought of myself as a little girl. I never thought of myself as a little girl. I always had to grow up fast. So I became the embodiment of an adult. A messed up adult, a little toxic. But you know what? I was an adult. <laughs> the moment I started to see myself like a kid I, and, and learn oh, there's a little child in me that has wants, needs, desires. What does a kid do when, they, when they're doing something new? They're curious. They're asking questions. They're exploring. They're not in their head thinking, so how do I figure this out? <laughs> right? They're yeah. children. So get, get into that child mentality. Get curious. What is happening? Why? I wonder why this is happening to me. What's the best thing that I can do right now with all that I have that I can't do, right? Yeah. What, what, what are alternative solutions? What if I try this? What if I try that? What if I try that? Become a kid again. And I carry that with me all the time in everything I do. Play. Play Fun, with the situation. Yeah. Because the thing is, if you can't change it, then, then you got to roll with it. Then how do you roll with it? Become the, the person that embraces it. And kids are so good at being in uncomfortable situations and in being in new situations because they don't have a predetermined way of doing things. We do. So we cause ourselves pain. We're like, I should be married by now. I should have a happy family. I should, I should, I should. And so when you veer off that, you're judging yourself harshly. But a kid, yes. he doesn't know what he had before. So I get into that child mentality and be like, if I had no pre-assumptions of what I think this should look like, what would I try? What would I do? How would I show up? So really getting curious about what is happening in this new beginning and how to make the best out of it, while also honoring the grief that may come from, from having to let go of things that are no longer coming with you. It's honoring this, this complex thing of, this is why I talk about wholeness. Right? 
We've been taught to see the light in us. See me as beautiful. See me as shiny. See me as, as professional. See me as I got my shit together. See me as a good mom. So I have this painting here. You won't be seeing it if you are on audio, but if you see video, this is my shadow. And this is what I talk about embracing wholeness. I embrace the toxic version of me. I love her. I love the manipulative, the hurt. I love her so much because she taught me so much. And I literally keep a visual representation of her because she's a queen. When she's, she's taught me so much. And this is why I talk about wholeness. Because it, when, we do, when we do anything in life, we only want to experience the beautiful things. We only want to experience the, the things that are jolly and joyful and peaceful. But this is my anger. This is my deception, my deceit, my lies, my everything that's made me who I am that's painful is here. But when used well, when she could get to transform through her fire, she's a baddie. She makes me money. She loves me. She has amazing sex. She does all the things. You know what I mean? Yeah. So this is where the wholeness comes from. This is why when you're doing a new beginning, it's not just about celebrating. For example, when I moved to Colombia, I was happy that I moved. But I was also grieving the life I thought I was going to have with a partner that I no longer was going to have. Basically, the gist of this is this. When you are doing anything in life, we've been told by religion, by society, that there's good and bad. We've been taught to think in black and white. What I want to teach women is that that's not how it works. We know that's not how it works, but we lie to ourselves. We live in this gray area of complexities and we need our light as much as our darkness to be whole. We need to accept all the parts of us that we don't like to see in order to work from wholeness because it's from wholeness that we can find healing and that we can build beautiful things for ourselves. It's when we're trying to only work from this version of us where it's like, I'm only perfect. <laughs> or, even when, or even when we're being imperfect, it's still inauthentic. I've seen inauthentic vulnerability. I've seen it. Right. And when you're authentically vulnerable, you smell that shit like miles away. You're like, you're trying to use authenticity as, as a tool. But, but, but I understand them, you know, because that's how good our shadow is at hiding. Our shadow doesn't want to be seen, right? Right. So, but our wholeness is so necessary to, to build from a place of actually, I know what I want. And this is another hack for if you want to, if you want people to stop shaming you for things, embrace the things that you're ashamed about. Yeah. Embrace the things that I'm, you're ashamed about. The thing is, I used to be ashamed of being a bad mom. Well, when I accepted I was a bad mom and accepted that as part of, a part of my wholeness, that whenever people try to call me a bad mom, I laugh. I'm like, so cute. So sweet. <laughs> right? It's, it just doesn't, because I've embraced it. I've embraced it. When people used yeah. to shame me for being, you know, one of my biggest shame things was like being exactly like my dad. And my mom used to love that. You're exactly like your father. Exactly. And, and in my head, my dad was this terrible human being who did so many bad things to my mother and so many bad things to our family. And it took me embracing him and being like, yes, I am definitely capable of being exactly like my father. And if I don't embrace being exactly like him, I'm going to be more like him. So, yes. Right. And now people can yeah. tell me whatever they want. And I'm like, yes, I am that thing. Yes, I can be a bitch. Yes, I sometimes lie. Really <laughs> right? It's not running away from that. You know what I mean? Like, it's the same thing that we were talking about before. It's not running away from what you are. It's embracing it and being like, yes but I'm going to put this to good use or, or whatever. Same as, as your dark side, same as your more um, pushy go, go, go side, right? Like the masculine side where we're yeah. all push, 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 um, embrace it in a certain way and it will work for you, but keep pushing things away. It's just going to become bigger and bigger and, and take over and, you know, you won't be balanced. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. So tell us about your book. Yes, yes, it's been, I say, to, I say it's a lifetime in the making, but two years in the actual process of it. Um, I know how <laughs> it feels like I'm birthing my second child. I think this is the second child I was dreaming about. <laughs> um, it's really, it's, it's called Finding My Way Home. It's, it's stories about growing up and how I looked for home in all the wrong places. How I've, I've been, you know, I left Colombia and from there I've been kind of in search through my childhood of home and how I've been 
kind of betrayed both by adults and society in a lot of ways and left behind. And I had to kind of grapple with the idea of like, if no one comes to save me, then how do I save myself? Right. right. And I think it's stories, it's stories based on my life. But ultimately, the lesson is all the same for all women, because at, at some point in our life, we've all felt the same way. We've all felt forgotten. We've all felt unseen. We've all felt that we, we had to be validated through someone else or through something else. That being us alone was never enough. You know, mm-hmm. that me standing on my own two feet and saying exactly what I want without a man, without a plan, without knowing exactly why I'm doing what, what I'm doing is not enough. And therefore, it's unworthy of anything. Right. So it's a book about that. I'm hoping that it will be out in the market by November of this year. Fingers crossed. The editing is extensive, but it's 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 my baby. And you know what? I, I believe in divine timing. So it will be here when it is ready to come out, just like my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah. you know That's exciting so tell everyone where they can follow you your instagram handle all that yes stuff. okay so big news today's your lucky day because today's the day i'm launching my website finally um i haven't had a website this whole time that i've been online which is hilarious because people always say like how do you make money you need a website i'm like People have paid me a shit ton of money without a website. So all of you thinking that you need a website to start a business, you don't. Okay. True. <laughs> um, but I'm just launching my website today at 11 a.m., not 11, um, 12 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So I'm excited for that. But basically, it's my brand now is called For the Women I Love. It's www.forthewomenilove.com. You can find me at Gisela Holgan on Instagram or for the woman I love um, Instagram handle, which is just starting up today, but really find me at my, at my name. That's where, I'm, where it's at. Um, and that's where you'll see a part of who I am, what I'm doing with the world. And why did I call it that? Good question, Megan. I knew you were going to ask that. <laughs> uh, well, well, such a good question, but honestly, as women, sometimes it's the thing is we've, it, I think it comes from the idea of passing down information, passing down knowledge and wisdom. And that's what I want to do. I want to pass down my wisdom the way I wished it was passed down to me instead of used against me, instead of used to judge me, instead of used to control me. And secondly, when I create anything and I think about the women that I'm impacting, first of all, I think about my little sister because I love her dearly. And she's, go- she's gone through a rough time lately, the last couple of years. And it's, it's my dedication to her and to my daughter and saying, this is what I wish you, you know, knew about life, about business, about healing. And this is my gift to you and to all women that are ready to hear the, to, to heal and to build, right? Because it's about healing and building. I want women to heal so that they can build from wholeness, not come to me and be like, why is my strategy not working? The strategy doesn't matter, darling. I built a good thriving business with no website no expertise in this. I did my political science degree, but you know how I proved myself? By my evolution, my transformation and the transformation I offer my clients. And that's what we all seek. You can self, I'm the author of my life and you can be the author of your life. And so that's why I created this brand of, it is for the women. It is for the women that I love. And I love women dearly, even if they're bitches, I love them even more because you know what? I know their pain. I know their pain. (laughs) I love that. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here with us today. I I feel like I could go on and on with you. I I will have to have you back because I have even more questions. (laughs) I love it. Hopefully we'll do part two soon. (laughs) Yes, Megan, thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to talk to you. I always loved your energy. You are so talented and such a beautiful human and I'm so glad that we get to connect in this way. I'm so glad too. Thank you so much.